Hi, Lagim fam. Before I start this episode, I would like to quickly plug my second and new podcast called Asia in the Shadows, a true crime podcast. This is being produced in partnership with Podcast Network Asia. Here is a trailer. Asia. It is the largest and most diverse continent on this planet. From the former Soviet states in Central Asia, to the cold Siberian territory of the north, to the tundras in Mongolia, to the white sandy beaches of the Philippines, and the bustling metropolitans in China and India, Asia is a microcosm on its own. But like any place on Earth, Asia also harbors mysteries and, of course, shocking crime stories. Hi, my name is Christine, and this is Asia in the Shadows, a true crime podcast. In this podcast, I will be sharing true crime stories from all over Asia. Each episode will feature a different country and a different crime story. So, if you want to take a break from the usual crime stories of the West, the Bundys, Dahmers, and Gacy's of this genre, and listen to stories that you may not have heard about before, then make sure that you tune in to Asia in the Shadows, a true crime podcast. I release three stories every month, and I do so on a Wednesday. Asia in the Shadows is brought to you in partnership with Podcast Network Asia and is available on all major podcasting platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, and Google Podcasts. Make sure to also follow us on Instagram at AITSPod for podcast updates and extra true crime content. See you soon. LGBTQIA rights have long been fought for, but the movement to win rights for the community has never been louder and more visible than in the last 10 years. The fight not only for basic rights, such as the right not to be discriminated against in all aspects of life, but also for more media visibility, is something that has intensified but is still not over by a long shot. Whilst we have seen huge and important steps in improving the lives of the gay, lesbian, and bisexual members of the community, one group seems to get left behind and mostly ignored in the fight for equality. That is the trans community. In an article in the Washington Post, Evan Greer opened her piece by showing that the trans community is faced by a lot of obstacles. She wrote that in the U.S., Policy changes would sometimes seek to purposefully erase transgender and non-binary people from federal rights law. Greer further explains that not only does the trans community get hate from the usual suspects, such as the religious community, but it also gets attacked from within the community itself. Greer explains that the mainstream gay movement has in the past not only left the trans community behind, but also fought on the wrong side of issues that deeply affected the trans community. This is ironic, since members of the trans community have always been loud and proud and at the forefront in the fight for equality. It comes to no surprise also that Whilst we have seen an improvement in the treatment of gay, lesbian, and bisexual members of the LGBTQ community, the trans community has, despite more visibility thanks to the internet, become very vulnerable. The U.S. and other countries still struggle to understand that trans rights are human rights, and they bicker about which public bathrooms trans people should be using, and other countries cannot seem to pass laws to make it easier for trans people to change the gender markers on their official IDs and passports. The transphobia, of course, goes beyond these couple of examples. The discrimination, violence, bullying, and harassment of trans people worldwide are things that we may not hear about every day on mainstream media, but they most definitely exist. 
It would also come to nobody's surprise that in the Philippines, there is even less willingness to discuss the status of the LGBTQIA community and even less awareness of what this community is about, specifically what the trans community is about. Their needs, their wishes, the rights that they should have as Filipino citizens. Whilst we see prominent gay, lesbian, and sometimes trans people of celebrity status in the Philippines, the acceptance of them comes with a caveat that whilst they are allowed to entertain us, make us laugh and cry in movies and TV shows, in no way should members of the LGBTQIA community demand equal rights from the cis heteronormative society they live in. And the same goes for transphobia specifically. There is even less understanding and acceptance there. The prevalent transphobia in both the West and East has shown how easily a trans voice can be silenced and how easily the life of a trans person can be ended with little to no consequence. This is the story of Jennifer Laude. Mabuhay. Welcome to Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. My name is Christine, and I am glad you can stop by to listen to this episode on Jennifer Laude. Make sure to look out for a bonus episode that I will be releasing in a few days from the release of this episode. This bonus episode is an interview with trans rights advocate Thais Estrada, who I had the absolute honor and privilege of talking to earlier this year. I am still in the process of editing the interview, so I will let you know through social media when it is ready. As always, please be warned that some details in this episode can be graphic and therefore upsetting. Please take care of yourself whilst listening. Jennifer Laude was a vibrant and yet hardworking person, a daughter with big dreams for her family and a partner who was planning on getting married soon. Originally from Matagok, Leyte, in Visayas, Jennifer came from humble beginnings and wanted more for herself and her family. Her journey to a better life led her first to Olongapu City to the north of the Philippines. Jennifer worked in a beauty salon and would send money to her mother regularly. Her mother, Nanay Julita, spoke highly of her daughter, always telling people that if it had not been for her daughter, they would not have the home they live in now. In the documentary Call Her Ganda, one aspect that was sort of spoken about, but in what I felt vague terms, was whether Jennifer also worked as a sex worker. It seemed implied, at least, that Jennifer dabbled in sex work, and certainly the narrator of the documentary journalist Meredith Talusan did write about how Jennifer had, quote-unquote, clients. Jennifer's then-fiancé, German national Mark Zuselbeck, seemed to not really accept this and skirts around the subject in a way. But it is this aspect of Jennifer's life that led to her crossing paths with a 19-year-old U.S. Marine named Joseph Scott Pemberton. In telling this story, I heavily relied on Filipino and U.S. news articles as well as the documentary. Whilst all articles used for the production of this episode are listed in the sources list, the documentary is not available for free. I purchased the DVD from the States and I have just learned that Amazon Prime users in the States can stream it through Prime Video. I wish I could somehow duplicate the DVD and make it available for you, for everyone, but I am not that tech smart. If you have any suggestions on how to do that, please DM me. One friend suggested a watch party and I was genuinely mulling this over, but I don't know how to start a tech party. Again, if you know how to do this, let me know. If you're interested in really organizing this watch party, then do give me some sort of signal or 
if you have a better idea of how to organize such a thing, then let me know because I would love for you to watch the documentary as well. Anyway, back to the story. Just so we are all on the same page, Jennifer Laude was a transgender woman. Her story cannot be divorced from this part of her identity, and I will make sure to touch upon the why of this later on. So what happened to Jennifer? On the 11th of October, 2014, Jennifer left her house at around 10.30 in the evening. She met up with friends at the Ambience Bar in downtown Olongapo. It was a busy night. There were U.S. Marine and Navy men around who were ready to party. They had arrived on the 29th of September, 2014 to take part in naval exercises at different locations in the Philippines. Under the so-called VFA or Visiting Forces Agreement, U.S. Army troops are allowed to dock and disembark on Filipino shores for such naval exercises. But after a week or so of intense work, the troops were allowed to venture out into the notorious red light district and party strip of Olongapo for some R&R. One of the Marines ready to let his hair down that night was Private First Class Joseph Scott Pemberton, a 19-year-old from New Bedford, Massachusetts. He was with two other fellow Marines that night as they also headed into the ambience bar. One of Jennifer's friends was quickly chatted up by one of Pemberton's friends, and before the night was over, Jennifer was talking to Pemberton. Both of them, and another one of Jennifer's friends called Barbie, then headed to a hotel nearby called the Cell Zone Lodge. CCTV footage shows both Jennifer and Pemberton at around 10.56 at the said location. Elias the bellboy and cashier at the lodge, checked the trio in, and by 11.05, the trio were assigned room one. Barbie would later recount how Jennifer negotiated the price of her services. She demanded 5,000 pesos. Pemberton wanted to pay only 1,000 pesos, which was roughly around $25 at that time. Fearful that the haggling with Pemberton would anger him or lead him to learn that Jennifer was trans, Jennifer accepted the counteroffer and told Barbie to go. As far as we know, this was the initial version given by Barbie at that time, but some additional details would later be revealed. You will know when we get to this point. So remember Elias, the bellboy and cashier at the Cell Zone Lodge? Well, in his testimony, about 30 minutes after he checked in the trio, Jennifer, Barbie, and Pemberton, and after Barbie had left the lodge, Pemberton walked out the Cell Zone Lodge quite nonchalantly and casually. Elias found it odd that Jennifer did not follow Pemberton out of the hotel. Elias could not know that the Marines and Navy men had a curfew and Pemberton was desperate to go back to their base. But he would later also learn another reason why Pemberton left so unbothered without a Jennifer in tow. So, Elias went up to the room and saw how room one's door was still ajar. He walked in and was horrified to see Jennifer's lifeless body in the bathroom. Jennifer's upper body was naked. She was partially covered from the waist down, and her neck seemed full of dark bruises and strangulation marks. What was even more upsetting was that her head was in the toilet. The whole scene in front of Elias and the rest of the hotel staff was devoid of any dignity and respect, a perhaps foreshadowing of things to come in this case. Now, whilst this was unfolding in the cell zone lodge, some of Jennifer's friends were wondering where she and Barbie were. In the documentary, a friend of Jennifer's recounted how they were waiting at a convenience store near the ambience bar, hoping that Jennifer and Barbie would turn up soon. They were drinking some soda and resting from finishing work at that point. They began worrying when they still did not see Jennifer and Barbie anywhere. At that point, a call from Barbie came in. Barbie informed them that something had happened. 
Jennifer had fainted, or dead. The news did not sink in right away. Which was it? Did she faint, or was she dead? Things happened quickly after that. The police arrived after Elias had called them in. They saw what Elias had walked into just minutes before and knew that they were in for a long night of collecting evidence and an even longer investigation. By the next day, the Philippine National Police, or PNP, spoke to the media about Jennifer's death and declared that they were working hard to track down the suspect seen by Elias. Since it was clear from Elias' initial statement that Jennifer was with a white man who was very likely to be part of the naval exercises from the past few days, the U.S. Embassy had to also put out a statement. By the 13th of October, two days after Jennifer was found dead, the U.S. Embassy expressed their sympathy to Jennifer's family and vowed to investigate the possible involvement of an American citizen in the crime. As a result of this, the departure of the two naval ships, the USS Peleliu and Germantown, from Subic Bay was stopped, pending the results of the investigation, of course. The next day, the 14th of October, after initially deciding to not disclose the name of their one and only suspect at that moment, the PNP made public the name of the person they had started investigating, Private First Class Joseph Scott Pemberton. Reports at the same time stated that Pemberton was identified after coordination with the United States NCIS, or the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Specifically, he was identified by a witness through a photo lineup. And I am hazarding a guess here that the witness was Elias, although his name was never specified in any of the reports that I've read. The police were clear that they were investigating Jennifer's death as a hate crime, but instead of Pemberton drawing the ire of Filipinos for killing their fellow citizen, Jennifer was slowly but surely becoming the villain in the story. This was when Jennifer's story started becoming not only about a trans woman who was killed by a white U.S. Marine, but about the Filipinos' visceral reaction to Jennifer being trans. The transphobia demonstrated from that moment onwards would show just how much work was still needed and is still needed to forward trans rights in the Philippines and to raise awareness. Remember at this time, Pemberton was in custody of the U.S., and this was not something ad hoc or unheard of. This was something that was provided for in the VFA or the Visiting Forces Agreement. Pemberton was being held on board the USS Peleliu while a joint NCIS and PNP investigation was ongoing. I will briefly get to the topic of the VFA soon enough in this episode, so don't you worry. I will not gloss over that issue. In any case, the initial investigation yielded that Pemberton did not deny that he hurt Jennifer, but his actions were only prompted by him discovering that Jennifer was trans. Pemberton was using the trans panic defense for hurting Jennifer. The public would learn later as well that after Pemberton arrived back at his ship, after he said he hurt Jennifer, he pulled a fellow Marine to his side and confided about what he did. He told him that he panicked because, and I quote, it had a dick, end of quote. The results of this initial investigation, when finally made public, prompted a deluge of victim blaming and deeply hateful and transphobic comments from the Filipinos and people abroad. Jennifer did not get any sympathy for what had happened to her. In the many comments I have seen and the ones highlighted in the documentary, Jennifer was purposefully and constantly being misgendered, mocked, insulted, and downright spoken of like she was not a human being. To say that this was heartbreaking is an understatement. 
The common sentiment was that Jennifer had it coming. She was portrayed as someone who deserved death because she was trans, because she did not, as per Pemberton, disclose that she was trans, and because she was a trans sex worker. For all these intersectionalities in Jennifer, her fellow Filipinos could not see her humanity, her Filipinoness, or at least did not want to see it. It is after all easier to hate and spew vitriol towards a dead person when you block out the fact that she was a human first and foremost. Now, with regards to the Visiting Forces Agreement and how it related to Jennifer's case, we know that this is a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and the Philippines. The U.S. negotiated the agreement in such a way that when one of their soldiers commits a crime on Philippine soil, they will have jurisdiction over that person. This is specifically agreed in Article 5 of the document. Filipino authorities, therefore, will not be able to do anything, essentially. In this case, however, the Filipino authorities strongly suggested that the U.S. waived this part of the agreement. Then, Philippine Foreign Secretary Albert del Rosario said, quote, In the normal course of events, the U.S. would have custody of the suspect, but in the case of heinous crimes, we could ask them to waive custody, so I suppose it will go in that direction. End of quote. And so Filipinos waited with bated breath whether the U.S. would indeed turn over Pemberton to the PNP, and that wait was a long one. In the meantime, those Filipinos who saw what happened to Jennifer for what it really was started gathering in front of the USS Peleliu the next day, the 15th of October. They arranged a protest. This was also the day when Jennifer's older sister, Marilu Laude, officially filed a murder complaint against Pemberton. It was up to the local prosecutor now to decide whether there was a prima facie case to answer, meaning whether there was enough initial evidence to file formal charges against Pemberton in court. The VFA commission then served Pemberton with a subpoena related to the murder complaint, meaning that Pemberton would have now to appear in court for an arraignment. Meanwhile, a spokesperson from the Foreign Affairs Office expressed that they would finally be making a formal request for the U.S. to waive their rights under the VFA, therefore allowing Pemberton to be held in custody, hopefully in a Filipino jail, pending any investigation and perhaps a trial. Between the 15th and the 24th of October, there was always something new in the headlines about the case. The eyes of the nation and the world were fixed upon the Philippines, a tiny archipelago, a former U.S. territory, and once named Asia's sick man, going against the planet's superpower, the USA. How will this go down? This was not just a criminal matter anymore. This was a diplomatic issue. This was a post-colonial issue, and most of all, this was a human rights issue. Whilst protests were erupting not only at Subic Bay and Olongapo, but in different parts of the country and online as well, Jennifer's autopsy was finally concluded. The autopsy report stated that Jennifer Laude died of asphyxiation by drowning. The report also reiterated that nail clippings from Jennifer were taken and submitted for DNA testing. Lung tissues were also submitted for examination and blood, urine, and stomach samples were taken for a toxicology examination. The autopsy report also confirmed that Jennifer's neck bruises were consistent with injuries sustained from strangulation. Meanwhile, the condoms recovered from the bathroom were also sent in for DNA testing to determine if the semen contained in them matched that of Pemberton. Forensic experts from the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Laboratory determined that one of the three condoms and a condom wrapper recovered from the cell zone lodge room one had Pemberton's fingerprints on them, 
The DNA within the condoms did not match Jennifer's DNA, however, but there was no information in my research whose DNA it matched or whether the DNA was viable at all for testing. It has to be noted here, however, that the Filipino investigators never got hold of this evidence themselves, meaning they could not test the condom wrapper or the condom themselves and had to take the American investigators' word for it, something that would become a huge point of contention further down the line during court proceedings. Apropos court proceedings, by the 15th of October, Olongapo city prosecutors finally charged Pemberton with murder by way of a 23-paged resolution. The other lawyer who was representing the laudes pro bono, Harry Roque, yes, that Harry Roque, considered the filing of the charges a huge victory. Now, just as a side note here, it is not lost on me that Mr. Roque, as a lawyer, will go through some evolution of his own after he was involved in the Laude case, and we will hear about that later as well. I know that people have all sorts of opinions and feelings about this man, but during this time, he was, for all intents and purposes, on the right side of history, in my opinion. He was working pro bono to fight for justice for a murdered trans woman. And with the prevalence of Filipino macho culture, Roque, as a male lawyer, must have caught some flack for taking on that case. Again, we'll hear what will happen to Roque later. With all the noise coming from all directions, Jennifer, in a solemn ceremony attended by friends and family, was finally laid to rest on the 24th of October, 2014. Her family remained heartbroken, and I cannot even begin to imagine the hurt they were feeling, let alone the anxiety that came with the knowledge that this whole thing was far from over. If anything, the so-called Calvario of the Laude family was just really beginning. So let us briefly look into this custody issue. Remember that I told you how the VFA was drafted in a way that when a U.S. soldier commits a crime on Philippine soil, he, she, or they will need to be turned over to U.S. authorities, but the Filipino government in the Laude case wanted the U.S. to waive that provision given the heinous nature of Jennifer's killing. The U.S. would not budge, however, despite the VFA Commission's involvement. In the end, the Filipino Department of Foreign Affairs stood down and stated that they will not insist anymore that Pemberton be surrendered to Filipino authorities. Instead, they would defer to the courts when the trial started. By February 2015, Pemberton submitted a motion to have his murder charge overturned but this was swiftly denied by the DOJ or the Department of Justice. Pemberton needed to be arraigned, and when he finally appeared before the court for his arraignment, he refused to enter a plea. The court, as a result, entered a plea of not guilty on his behalf, something that the court was allowed to do in these circumstances. The court then scheduled the trial to begin on the 23rd of March, 2015. And so March 2015 rolled in, but before we get into parts of the trial that I would really like to talk about, I think there is merit in unpacking the murder charge for a few seconds here. As we are told by lawyers Virgie Suarez and Harry Roque, the murder charge in this case was coupled up with aggravating factors, so to speak. These factors were that the perpetrator had to be or was of superior strength in comparison to the victim and that there was an added element of cruelty. Suarez explained that premeditation is not necessarily needed in order to prove murder. In her opinion, Pemberton ticked all the boxes of those aggravating factors. As a trained Marine, he was most definitely of superior strength. 
He may not have planned Jennifer's death, but it was enough that he committed the act. As mentioned, premeditation was not needed, according to Suarez. Furthermore, the fact that Jennifer was strangled to death, her head pushed down into the toilet that resulted in her drowning, tick the box about cruelty. In the eyes of the Laude family lawyers and the Laude family themselves, and both public and private prosecutors, all elements of this aggravated murder were present, and it should not be difficult to convict Pemberton. As we are told by the documentary, the trial lasted a long time. It was a little over a year. During this time, the Laude family bore witness to repeated attempts by Pemberton's Filipino lawyers to seemingly stall the court proceedings. For example, on the fourth day of the hearing, the defense refused to present evidence. Hearings kept getting postponed and rescheduled. We would learn from the documentary eventually that it was the prosecution's suspicion that the delaying tactics by the defense was an attempt to prolong the proceedings. We are told that as per the visiting forces agreement, if a criminal proceeding has lasted for a year, Pemberton would be free to go, just like that. And it sure looked like the defense was using this loophole in order to get their client off of the murder charge and just have him fly back to the U.S. without being held accountable for what he did at all. When this became clear to everyone, including the court and the public, the defense eventually had to present evidence. The stalling could not go on forever, and the Filipinos were not ready to see Pemberton go without any punishment. Or at least, some Filipinos were of that opinion. Finally, the defense presented their case and had Pemberton's mother testify as to her son's character. The core of the defense's argument that they hoped would cast reasonable doubt on the prosecution's case was that there was apparently a 30-minute gap in which Jennifer was alone in room one of the cell zone lodge. The door was not secured during these 30 minutes and surely one cannot say if in that short amount of time, someone else may have had entered the room and killed Jennifer after Pemberton had left the lodge. During the trial, it was the defense's submission that yes, Pemberton had hurt Jennifer in a so-called trance panic and then left room one of the cell zone lodge. But according to Pemberton, Jennifer was very much still alive. Another part of the defense's submission was to say that surely Pemberton could not be painted as homophobic or transphobic because he comes from a good home and his sister is in fact gay. Now, if you feel like this actually negated what the defense said about Pemberton reacting in a so-called trans panic, what the defense was actually saying was that whilst Pemberton had nothing against gay or trans people, he felt violated not knowing that Jennifer was actually trans and therefore reacted, as we will hear later on, in self-defense. As for the argument that one cannot be homophobic or transphobic because one's sibling is gay or a lesbian, we know how ridiculous this argumentation is. It is like saying, I cannot be racist because I have black friends, or I cannot be prejudiced against people with disabilities because my mom uses a wheelchair. This argument does not hold water at all. We have serial killers and serial rapists with sons and daughters. We have arsonists who were firefighters. We have murderers who were medical professionals. Proximity to a marginalized or oppressed group does not absolve you from your own problematic views, beliefs, ideologies, and prejudices. Proximity to a benevolent profession does not automatically make you a saint. 
Pemberton's proximity to his gay sister does not make him not a murderer of a trans woman. Having said all that, let's go back now to the court proceedings in 2015. It was now time for Pemberton's mother to take the stand. As I said, this was more of a chance to portray Pemberton as a good son, as an upstanding citizen who was not capable of committing murder. Of course, Pemberton's mother did not really add anything to the defense's case evidence-wise. She was a mere character witness, and being Pemberton's mother, she was bound to be biased. Now, by August 2015, Pemberton finally took the stand in his own defense, and we hear a few more details from what happened allegedly that night. We know from earlier in the episode that Pemberton negotiated the price of Jennifer's services. When the price was agreed, Pemberton said that Barbie, Jennifer's friend who was with them, before she left both Pemberton and Jennifer in the room at the cell zone lodge, actually performed oral sex on him and then left. It is not clear whether she was paid by Pemberton as well. When they were finally alone, Pemberton stated that Jennifer also performed oral sex on him, but he wanted more from her. We can safely assume that by more, Pemberton meant that he wanted to have sexual intercourse with Jennifer and may have started to act in a way that would initiate this. According to him, in the process of perhaps getting more out of Jennifer, he was surprised to find out that Jennifer was trans. Pemberton told the court that he felt as if he was raped. He said that he felt disgusted because he did not consent for a quote-unquote man to do what Pemberton wanted done. Misgendering aside... Pemberton insisted that he acted in self-defense of his life and honor when he eventually attacked Jennifer. Pemberton said in his testimony that he pushed Jennifer off the bed. Pemberton then said that Jennifer got back up and then slapped him in the face. Pemberton said that he retaliated by choking her, which left her unconscious. He maintained that he tried to revive her with water in the bathroom, but decided to leave after finding no water. He stated with certainty, I must say, that Jennifer was alive when he left her. Of course, we know that this was not the case at all. As I've already mentioned earlier, Pemberton's legal team wanted to create reasonable doubt here that maybe another person entered the room afterwards to, so to speak, finish the job and kill Jennifer. However, no matter how Pemberton would like to portray what had happened that evening, he hurt Jennifer, and whether he thought he ultimately killed her should not absolve him from his wrongdoing. As the trial moved on, the evidentiary part of the hearing finally concluded and the lawyers gave their final submissions. It was now up to the judge to understand and analyze all the evidence in front of them and come to a verdict. On the 1st of December 2015, a judgment was finally handed down by the Olongapo City Regional Trial Court. The judgment, that was 68 pages long, found Pemberton guilty of homicide beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge said Pemberton acted out of passion and obfuscation when he arm-locked Jennifer and pushed her head into the toilet. The court sentenced Pemberton 6 to 12 years in prison. It was made clear that Pemberton was to be confined and detained by Philippine authorities. Specifically, Pemberton was sentenced to sit his years in prison at the new Belibid prison in the nation's capital and also pay for loss of earning capacity to Jennifer's family. The amount was determined to be a little over 4 million pesos. Jennifer's family did not feel like this verdict, and especially that sentence, 
was full justice. The fact that murder was downgraded to homicide somehow made light of the hate crime aspect of the killing of Jennifer. In a way, the court accepted that Pemberton's crime was a crime of passion. And whilst I concede that the killing was likely not premeditated, the aggravating circumstances or factors mentioned by attorney Virgie Suarez were present and made Jennifer's death all the more gruesome. These aggravating circumstances were, as already mentioned, that A, Pemberton was of superior strength, given not only his stature but also his military training, and B, Pemberton killed Jennifer in a cruel manner, which was clearly demonstrated by the fact that he forced her head into the toilet. Now, on the day the verdict and the sentence were handed down, the scene became quite intense at court. Instead of standing up and letting the police officers lead him to his trip to Belibid, Pemberton did not move from his seat and stayed that way for an hour initially. This had become a standoff. Not only did Pemberton refuse to move, but the U.S. security detail with him did not allow Filipino police officers to take him. Involved in this standoff also were officers from the NCIS and members of the U.S. Embassy. Later on, we would learn that the standoff lasted for a total of three hours. And during that time, Pemberton was surrounded by two layers of security, the first being U.S. American soldiers and also Philippine officers as the second layer, which I found rather odd. It was believed that this standoff was a delaying tactic by Pemberton's legal team to allow them to file a motion for reconsideration in relation to Pemberton's sentence and where he was going to sit said sentence. In a surprising move, the court said it would consider the motion and until further notice, Pemberton's prison sentence needed to be delayed. In the meantime, Pemberton was to be sent to Camp Aguinaldo until a final decision could be reached in the appeal that was filed by his lawyers. This was not questioned by the Department of Justice, and this really showed to the Filipinos some very problematic aspects in the relationship with the United States. How is it that Pemberton was allowed to have this special treatment whilst any other Filipino in the same situation would not be afforded the same privilege? Personally, what I thought of what happened in that standoff and what was also mentioned in the documentary was that what happened in that courtroom was in a way an undermining of Filipino sovereignty and our judicial system. In any other criminal case, the convicted person, as I said, would be taken into prison. He or she or they can then start the process of appealing their case with the help of their lawyers. I do not think I've ever heard of a case where the convicted person essentially proceeded to throw a tantrum or a standoff in order to force a sort of sped up version of an appeal only to not even go into prison, but to temporarily wait things out at the AFP headquarters in Camp Aguinaldo. Naturally, Jennifer's family was angered about this development in the case. What little justice they thought had been served after the verdict and sentence were handed down seemed to have dissipated in the face of this unusual and yet unsurprising development. For me, this decision by the court to essentially give in to the Americans set a very problematic and dangerous precedent. But then again, this is not surprising given the terms of the Visiting Forces Agreement with the U.S. That document alone provides for little to no protection for Filipinos who might fall victim of crimes committed by members of the U.S. military. Is it any surprise that the U.S. thought they could get away with forcing the hand of the judiciary, especially the Department of Justice, 
during their three-hour standoff. After all, from their perspective, the Americans were also worried to set a precedent in which an American member of their military could be incarcerated for a number of years on foreign land. This is something they really wanted to avoid. Now, before I proceed with the rest of Pemberton's appeal and how the case developed from the standoff onwards, I want to finally touch upon the problematic nature of the VFA quite briefly only. It is undeniable that our country's relationship with the U.S. is, as attorney Virgie Suarez said in the documentary, more comparable to a colonizer colony one rather than a relationship between countries of equal footing. Somehow, it has been almost encoded in our Filipino DNA that we owe the U.S. a special type of allegiance. The history that has been handed down to us tells us that we were essentially purchased by the Americans from the Spaniards. The Americans were seen as saviors who granted us our independence, which we could only have if we agreed that the U.S. could have continued access to our shores in the form of military bases. What is always forgotten, however, is that our ancestors fought the Americans as hard as they could when we were, quote-unquote, handed over by Spain. The Philippine-American War of 1899-1902, to a topic I have written about for my senior high school paper in Germany, was short and bloody. In the documentary, one can catch a short glimpse of a newspaper quote from back then that said, Kill everyone over 10. As in, kill every Filipino over 10 years old. Our ancestors, and I cannot stress this enough, knew that one colonizer was not better than the other, and they fought hard to not be under any imperial power anymore. Unfortunately, they lost, and the rest is, as they say, history. And yet, after that horrific war and more years of invasions and occupations by the Americans, and the Japanese, we are left with this burden to somehow accommodate the U.S. military under terms that can become very detrimental to our fellow citizens. What we get out of this visiting forces agreement seems so little compared to what the U.S. military gets from us. A member of the U.S. military, as I briefly touched upon already earlier in this episode, will be held in custody by the U.S. military if they commit any non-service offense whilst on Filipino soil, but is a Filipino soldier afforded the same courtesy if they commit a non-service offense on American soil? Probably not. Most definitely not. With Pemberton specifically, three things happened as a result of the VFA, and this was very astutely pointed out by Harry Roque in the documentary. Aside from being held in custody on board the USS Peleliu, he was never really investigated or questioned or interrogated or even forensically examined by the Filipino police authorities. And his attendance in court was a matter of cooperation and not mandated like in any other criminal case involving anyone else. Why does it have to be like this? Why can't we assert our sovereignty if not only to protect our own citizens? This was greatly shown in the Jennifer Laude case. The Filipinos were not at all in control of the proceedings as activist Naomi Fontanos said in the documentary. By the way, do follow Naomi on Twitter if you have an account. I will link her account in the show notes. She is well worth following on there. So, like Naomi said, the Americans were running the show. And she's right. All the delays, the conditions, and that court standoff were all power moves to twist the Philippine judicial arm into deciding in their favor. 
as stated in the documentary, the downgrading of the crime and the very light sentence was done to appease both Filipinos and Americans. And even then, the Americans were still not willing to let go of their soldier and were still hoping that the Filipino judiciary would just let Pemberton go. Now, let's finally get to Pemberton's appeal. So Pemberton's appeal filed with the Court of Appeals in January 2016 was making its way through the court system. And attorney Virgie Suarez tells us in the documentary that on behalf of the Laude family, it was decided that it was time to file another complaint against Pemberton. And this time it was for disobedience of a lawful order of the court. At the same time, the Laudes boldly took on the Visiting Forces Agreement and filed a petition with the Supreme Court to essentially question its very nature. Meanwhile, the people of Olongapo were growing restless at the absence of U.S. soldiers, who essentially were the main customers and consumers of products and services offered by Filipinos in the city. You see, all U.S. soldiers were grounded and told to stay on their ship following Jennifer's death and whilst the case was ongoing. The soldiers were not allowed to go into the city and therefore they were not able to spend money in Olongapo, which led to a heavy loss of income amongst local business people. I am not sure how long the soldiers were prohibited from getting off their ship, but it must have been for a substantial amount of time because the locals started to turn against the Laude family. The people of Olongapo called the Laudes selfish for not backing down, for not taking a settlement instead and letting the case go to trial. There was an indifference towards the plight of the family and especially towards the hate crime perpetrated against Jennifer. A common sentiment was to just kick out all transgender women sex workers out of Olongapo, something that yet again shows or showed back then how members of the trans community and those in the sex industry are not seen as rightful members of Filipino society not deserving of the same rights and not deserving of justice when wronged. By March 2016, the Olongapo Regional Trial Court, in a surprising but perhaps not so surprising turn of events, reduced Pemberton's prison sentence from 12 to 10 years. He was also denied bail. This decision was then appealed by Pemberton, and in August 2017, the Court of Appeals affirmed the trial court's decision to sentence Pemberton to 10 years in prison. This is a quote from the appeals court decision. With respect to Pemberton's motion, we maintain our ruling that his invocation of self-defense is an admission of the killing and of its authorship. Pemberton's contention that he was only raising complete and incomplete self-defense in the physical injuries he inflicted upon Jennifer Laude is bereft of rhyme or reason as the former was not charged for any physical injuries but for homicide. End of quote. Furthermore, the Court of Appeals also upheld the payment of loss of earning capacity to Laude's family, amounting to about 4.32 million pesos. Mind you, despite the result of this appeal, Pemberton stayed at Camp Aguinaldo and not at Belibid. It is utterly puzzling to me that whilst he should at that point Point be considered a prisoner of the Philippines, somehow he was still allowed to stay at Camp Aguinaldo, where he was staying already before. He even refused to be moved to the AFP custodial center, another military facility, because, and I kid you not, there was no air conditioning there, and he simply refused to move somewhere where there wasn't any air conditioning. <laughs> 
Well, he should not have been allowed to even have that option. The only option he should have had was the new Belibid prison because he was now, or he was then, a prisoner of the Philippines. Naturally, Pemberton did not agree with the decision of the Court of Appeals, and so he prepared his appeal to now the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of the Philippines. But before that happened, we are informed by the documentary that the Laude family in Leyte were visited by someone called Georgetown, who was described as a white American man who came in from the U.S. to visit them. This must have been in the latter part of 2016 or the year after in 2017. All we know from the documentary is that this was in the month of November during one of Pemberton's appeals. The American man offered Jennifer's mother, Nana Julita, around 4.6 million pesos and told her that apparently Pemberton would be paroled and set free the following July. He gave her papers to sign, but they were all in English, so she naturally got scared and was hesitant to sign anything. She was also told by this man to not mention the papers and his visit to any of her lawyers. But again, Jennifer's mother refused to sign the papers and eventually told her lawyers about this man called Georgetown. The paper, as it turned out, provided, in essence, a sort of blanket indemnity that would release the U.S. military from all and every liability with regards to Jennifer's killing. Personally, I think this was a particularly insidious way of trying to trick Jennifer's family whilst the case was still on appeal. And whilst we're on the subject, let's go back to Pemberton's appeal to the Supreme Court. To everyone's surprise, Pemberton actually withdrew his appeal in June 2020. I would like to think and believe that he had done so because he may have finally felt remorse or guilt or wanted to take responsibility for what he had done to Jennifer, but... I do think that this was a calculated move to wait a couple more months and then look for another legal relief through a piece of Filipino legislation that we have already heard of in past episodes. You will not be surprised to learn that I am talking about the Good Conduct Time Allowance Law and Scheme, the same one that almost set Mayor Antonio Sanchez free the same law that set Claudio Tehanke Jr. free just a few years before Pemberton's appeal to the Supreme Court. So, having withdrawn from the appeals process within the Supreme Court, Pemberton filed a motion to avail of the GCTA law, and the Olongapo Regional Trial Court heard the motion in August 2020. Around this time, Pemberton also finally paid the Laudes the ordered payment from 2015. He paid 4.6 million pesos all in all. By September 2020, the Laude family was dealt another blow in their fight for justice. The Olongapo Regional Trial Court gave Pemberton full GCTA credits and approved his early release, meaning he was going to be released four years ahead of his full sentence. The Laude family, of course, questioned how his GCTA was computed since he was isolated in a special military facility in Camp Aguinaldo. Like I said, he never stepped foot in the new Belibid prison. So how is it that they could consider him for the GCTA scheme at all? Now, remember that at this point, Duterte was already president. And it was Duterte who made a promise that Pemberton would not be released from custody during his presidency. When the decision by the Olongapo Regional Trial Court was handed down, the Philippine government refused to grant an immediate release of Pemberton. 
Harry Roque, who was and still is presidential spokesperson, was even quoted saying that Jennifer's death personifies the death of Philippine sovereignty. These things happened between September 1st and 3rd of 2020. So imagine the shock and disappointment by the nation and the Laude family when on the 7th of September 2020, President Duterte granted Pemberton absolute pardon with Harry Roque fiercely defending the president's decision. In a matter of just four days, the office of the president flip-flopped so drastically you could have gotten a whiplash if you did not pay attention. Duterte was quoted saying in Tagalog, which I have now translated for ease, quote, Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I see this case. You've not treated Pemberton fairly, so I released him. Pardon. End of quote. It is not entirely clear from the president's statement which part of this case was unfair to Pemberton. From what we have heard so far, so much leeway and allowances were made for Pemberton. Now, following the president's statement, Roque also changed his tune and justified Duterte's pardon by saying Duterte had cleared only the sentence imposed on Pemberton, not the U.S. soldier's conviction. Now, that is really not a comforting thought, if I may be honest here. The whole point of a conviction is to see that conviction followed through by a sentence in which the convicted pays their debt to society, so to speak. In this case, Pemberton had not stepped foot in prison and got to leave even before the court-mandated sentence of 10 years. To make this sudden granting of absolute pardon even more unusual, Pemberton's lawyer, Rowena Garcia Flores, would later confirm that she never filed for the pardon and neither did the U.S. government. So this begs the question, who actually applied for Pemberton's absolute pardon? Were the proper processes observed? Were the appropriate papers filed? Or was this merely an arbitrary decision by the Duterte administration? I have not found any answers in my research, and I hope that one day we will have answers for this because it is highly unusual. By the 9th of September, Pemberton was set to be deported back to the U.S., and the process of doing so was started. Two days later, on the 11th of September, the Laudes expressed their dismay in the government's decision and reminded Duterte of his promise to not release Pemberton during his presidency. Unfortunately, this statement fell on deaf ears because, on the 13th of September, Pemberton was flown out of the Philippines, putting a rather uncomfortable end to this case. Jennifer's case exposed multiple problems that highlight yet again how marginalized and oppressed communities in our society are not given proper regard, especially when they become victims of crimes, heinous or petty. It also exposed a very lopsided relationship with a superpower who is less interested in an alliance and more insistent on Philippines' unconditional obedience. But most of all, it exposed the very serious and blatant problem of transphobia in our country. As a people, I think we tend to forget that we are Filipinos first, before anything else. If one is Catholic or Muslim, straight or queer, progressive or traditional, then that is fine. But remember that first and foremost, you are Filipino. Filipino trans women and men have as much a right to be respected and to avail of the laws of the land as you and I do. To those who shout loudly about how being transgender is not part of our Filipino culture, I wonder what that exactly means. In any case, 
please remember that pre-Hispanic or pre-colonial Philippines very much accepted and revered trans women who served as leaders, babaylans, and advisors in local communities. Transness has always existed in the Philippines and the world, in fact. And if you cannot find it in your heart just yet to defend one's transness against oppression and aggression and even murder, then at least defend their Filipinoness. That person is still your kapwa. Lagim fam, it seems that with every case in this current season, I end up creating longer and longer episodes. Do tell me if you think that is not what you want. I always get mixed reviews about episode lengths. Again, watch out for the bonus episode that I will be releasing in a few days. This is an episode with Thais Estrada, an interview that I did with her earlier this year. And we talked about a lot of things, but mostly about Jennifer and being trans in the Philippines. Lagim fam, if you like my podcast content, please consider rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts and following the podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. If you want to support the podcast financially, you can always become a patron on Patreon. We have three different tiers with different perks, such as bonus episodes about crime stories involving Filipinos in the diaspora. And you can also make one-off donations through buymecoffee.com. All the links to these platforms are in our Instagram bio. Thank you again for all your support and for listening to today's episode. Maraming salamat at mabuhay.